No one expected the end of the world to be as cliché as it was. It felt like something written in a pulpy dime store comic book. Artificial intelligence and misinformation fueled the inevitable civil war in America and in countries across the world. We opened Pandora's box only to find a rabid creature inside. The sea lines rose quickly, so quickly that millions were killed in the wake of torrential tsunamis. Those that were left dispersed into the interior of America. Just when things didn't seem like they could get any worse, the virus broke out. Most of those who weren't killed by the war or the natural disasters were taken by it. Hope was a fragment of the past that most had forgotten. Its pale shimmer faded with the morale of a planet on the brink of total collapse. There were no technological systems in place anymore. No internet, no cell phones, and no computers. The old way of technology died when a solar flare decimated power grids across the world. Then there were the bombs. What overdone apocalypse story is complete without nuclear fallout? For many years, it seemed as though the chaos would never stop and that everyone might die. But humans are resilient. After centuries, humanity did what they always did. They persevered. Clans of people took refuge in the wilderness and began to rebuild. They were spread far and wide from one another. Some were civil and tried to harbor safe, inclusive environments that valued human life and progress. However, fuel, food, and shelter, among other things, became the most precious commodities. Just as humanity is inclined toward resilience, it is also inclined toward violence. Marauders and wicked gangs would show up to peaceful settlements and take what they wanted. And they wanted everything. Some settlements could fend them off. Others weren't so lucky. The settlement Sophia had lived in was one of the unlucky ones. Get under your bed, Sophia's mother whispered as she peeked through a small hole in the side of their ramshackle home. They lived in what was left of a trailer park, on their own. They'd been part of a group of survivors for a while, but several months ago, that group, like so many others, had been raided. Sophia and her mother narrowly escaped. The trailer park had been completely stripped of most of its resources, and more than half of it had been burned down, a perfect place to stay under the radar of traveling gangs. Their last escape hadn't been their first, and Sophia's mother felt it was safer to be on their own now. Mom, I... Sophia's mother turned with a finger to her lips and a look that insisted on silence. Sophia obeyed and crawled under her bed. What had been faint voices in the distance became louder. It was dark, and all Sophia's mother could see in the moonlight were vague outlines of people passing by. She'd been alerted to their presence by one of them letting out a blundering hoot moments ago. Safety didn't seem like much of a concern to them. After seeing a few of the meandering figures tip what looked like wine or liquor bottles to their lips, she understood why. There were at least a dozen of them, maybe more. Given their inclination to yell in the middle of the night and their current drink of choice, Sophia's mother had no interest in meeting them. One of them started to sing, and a few others quickly joined in. Moon comes back, moon comes slow, spill the blood, time will flow, take the stars, take the sun, it's all ours, watch them run. Their slurred song made Sophia's mother want to meet them even less. Then she saw a massive figure trailing behind a few of the men. She couldn't tell entirely, but it looked like he was being pulled by a huge chain wrapped around his neck, like a pet. One of the marauders stopped and looked at their trailer. The wind swept his clothing, and the tin roof of the trailer rattled. More of them walked on, but he continued to stand there and stare. Sophia's mother got nervous. Maybe he's looking at the moon, or a star, or a tree, she thought. One of the other men stopped as he walked by and waved a hand in front of the staring man's face. What's got you all froze up? The staring man replied by pointing toward the trailer. To Sophia's mom, it felt like he was pointing directly at her. Instinctively, she pulled her eye away from the hole and braced her back against the wall. She'd already blown out all of the candles, and the only light in the room was moonlight. It was enough for her to see Sophia peeking her head out from under the bed. What's wrong? Sophia whispered. Her mother pointed to the bed with one hand and put her finger to her lips again with the other. Then she moved back to the eye hole. The two men were slowly walking toward the trailer, catching the attention of some of the others in their gang. Sophia's mother's mind was racing, 
trying to think of anything she'd forgotten, any trace that might lead them to her and her daughter. She brought in all the tools, picked up their lawn picnic from earlier that day, and brought in the wash basin after doing laundry. That's when she realized what they were looking at and what they were moving toward. Sophia's yellow dress. It was Sophia's favorite piece of clothing, which her mother had scavenged from the trailer park. She wore it earlier to their picnic and stained it in the grass. Her mother was able to wash most of the stains out and told Sophia to pull it from the line when it was dry. There it flapped in the wind, a bright yellow beacon in the moonlight. One of the men put his thumb and pinky in his mouth and let out an ear-piercing whistle. The entire pack of men stopped. The man who had noticed the dress was now holding the end of it in his hand, staring at it. He seemed to be almost hypnotized by it. The man standing next to him spoke. Pretty little dress. Probably got a pretty little girl that goes inside it. The man holding the dress slammed a foot onto the other man's toes. If and there is, we're taking her to Ida, you skag. Sophia's mom turned and crawled to Sophia. Honey, hiding ain't gonna work this time. We gotta run again. Sophia was tired of running. I'm done running, Mama. This is the... Her mother cut her off by pinching her thumb and index finger together and swiping them through the air, a gesture she'd used most of Sophia's life to silence her when situations called for it. And this situation certainly called for it. Sophia's mother whispered with a much stronger sense of urgency. Baby, I know you're tired, but we don't have time to talk about this. If we don't leave right now, we're going to be... She was cut off by a loud creak from their small front wooden patio. Something was at their door. Something huge. Sophia hadn't seen the pet of the passing men, but her mother had. She didn't need to peek through the hole in the front of the door to know he was on the other side. There was a thunderous bang, followed by the sound of splintering wood. Their pet was smashing the door in. Sophia's mother grabbed Sophia by the arm and pulled her from under the bed. Crouching, they moved down the hallway of the trailer. There were several more bangs at the front door, and they heard it thud to the floor. Then a voice yelled into the trailer, Muck ain't gonna hurt you. He's a good boy, ain't you, Muck? Muck, the enormous boil-covered man, let out a loud, rattling breath of air, then clicked his teeth together, like an insect. The gang that had broken up Sophia and her mother's last group had several people like this one products of an extremely irradiated bloodline. Easy to tame, but quick to anger. After the many years of fallout, there seemed to be more and more of them. They would all grow to be two to three times the size of a normal human. But they were all horribly disfigured. Mostly, they had become commodities, bought and sold among the most terrible groups of survivors as slaves. Sophia's mother felt sorry for them but that sorrow wouldn't change her and her daughter's current situation. Sophia and her mother continued down the dark hallway to their bug-out bags and the back door. They heard the voice yell out from their front room, closer to the hallway now. Smells like y'all had something good for dinner in here. I'm a little mad y'all didn't make enough for all of us, though. They heard another loud crash from Muck in the front room. He's probably breaking down the door to the front bedroom, Sophia's mother thought. Sophia swung her bag around her shoulder and then handed her mother's to her. She pushed the back door open quickly. Her mother stopped her and moved in front of her before she went out. She scanned the yard in the moonlight, looking for any unseen marauders planning to spring on them. The men inside the trailer were now in the hallway, and Sophia and her mother were out of time. They went through the door and began to run for the tree line at the edge of the trailer park. Ahead in the distance, a figure emerged from the side of one of the other trailers. He was crouching, spinning something in the air from a rope. They changed course and started to run in another direction. Sophia glanced back at their trailer and saw the gigantic man that had busted through their front door emerge from their back door. The way that he made their trailer look so small as he contorted to get through the doorway looked odd to her. It made her home look like a toy in a giant's play yard. The air rushing past them as they ran muted what the men at the trailer were yelling, but they could hear the sound of the new man's spinning rope. It whistled through the night air with an eerie rhythm. Sophia and her mother were sprinting now. They slipped on a small mound of dirt but quickly regained their footing. Sophia looked back at the man spinning the object, and suddenly he stopped. She didn't hear the whistling anymore. Her mother fell face first into the grass.
Sophia, who had been holding her hand tightly as they ran, was pulled to the ground with her. Mama! she screamed. Then she crawled to her and flipped her onto her back. Having only moonlight, the bead of blood Sophia saw trickle down her mother's forehead looked black. She yelled again, Mama! Then she heard a wild yipping sound. She couldn't tell if it was coming from the men that broke into her trailer or the man who had shot the object at her mother's head. Sophia looked back down at her mother and touched her head. Whatever the man had hit her with wasn't lethal, but it left a nasty gash. Her eyes fluttered open. In a daze, she said, Baby, run! But Sophia was tired of running. She swung her bug-out bag to the ground, pulled out a cloth, and helped her mother push it to the wound. Then she pulled out her knife. She and her mother kept their knives sharp. After the end of the world, there were plenty of reasons to do so. The men and their pet were getting closer, as was the man who had taken out her mother. She began slowly walking toward the man who had sprung on them. He could see her knife glinting in the moonlight and yelled to her, Oh, ain't that precious. You're just a little thing, ain't you? Then he reached behind his back, pulled out a machete, and continued his approach. It didn't take long for the gap between them to close. Sophia looked up at the man. He reeked of stale smoke and fuel or alcohol. He knew she wouldn't run and knew that the rest of his crew wanted her kept alive. His eyes looked like black pits in the moonlight as he ran his finger along the non-sharpened edge of his machete. Why don't you hand me that blade, sweetie? Wouldn't want you to get cut. Sophia, making a conscious effort to look more scared than she was, shifted her grip from the knife's handle to its blade. Careful now, he smiled and tilted his head. With a flick of her wrist, her knife flew through the air and into the man's throat. He gasped, and Sophia heard him choking on his own blood. His machete fell to the ground moments before he did. When the end of the world happens, your only choice is to be prepared. Sophia and her mother didn't just spend their time hiding and having picnics. After their last brush with death, Sophia's mom made training part of their daily routine. Sophia had never killed a person before, but there had been times when she'd wanted to, even times when she almost had to out of circumstance. The dying man in front of her, spewing blood from his throat, was a reflection of what she'd been training for. In the grand scheme of her situation, though, his death wouldn't save her or her mother. Four other vile men and their pet were surrounding her, along with a string of more men coming from the front of her trailer. Even in the moonlight, Sophia could see the spit of the man who began to speak, flying from his mouth. Well, that wasn't too nice. Where are you off to, anyway? One final gurgling scream left the dying man on the ground. Sophia rolled to the machete the man had dropped and picked it up. Many more of the men were surrounding her now, and she could see that there were multiple giants among them as well. Sophia was waiting in a pool of tension. All eyes were locked on her. She couldn't see much in the dark, but then a hooded figure stepped forward into the circle and lit a lantern. It dangled from a rusty chain attached to the end of a twisted, hooked stick. The lantern fizzled to life and cast an ominous orange glow onto the mob surrounding her. Its glow felt unnatural and gave off much more light than a lantern of its size should have. Sophia could make out more of their details now. They didn't look like any pack of wanderers she had ever seen, and the gravity of her situation began to sink in as more people huddled around the circle. Some of them were wearing tattered denim overalls. Others wore pieced-together cloaks and capes made from burlap and patches of assorted fabrics. They all had arcane symbols painted or etched onto what they were wearing. Most of them had animal fur draped around them in one fashion or another. Animal bones dangled from rope or twine that was wrapped around their necks, arms, legs, and weapons. Their boots were cobbled together from what looked like rubber, animal hide, and leather. Some of them had bandoliers and belts fashioned from lengths of rusted chain, twine, and strips of cloth, holding assortments of pouches and vials. There were others that were bulkier. They wore more heavily armored attire made from scavenged metal scraps, animal bones, and thick hides. 
Some of the even bigger ones had crude armor welded together from rusty metal plates and chain mail. They too had symbols that were painted on their clothes and etched into their armor. All of them had weapons ranging from crude pieces of wood wrapped in barbed wire to somewhat sophisticated-looking crossbows. There were also a few swords and spears sprinkled into their ranks. The one who had lit the lantern wore a dark cloak that seemed to ripple with gold symbols in the moonlight. His strings of bones draped down from a helmet of antlers on top of his head that sat over his hood. Half of his face was covered with a mask made from an animal, like a bear or a large dog. The half that wasn't covered had a scar that ran from the top of his head to his chin, right over his eye. The eye itself was completely white and looked like it had been plucked from a cadaver. His voice was low and it rattled as he silenced the chattering of the mob. Quiet. The mob went silent, and the man looked down at Sophia. She was breathing heavily and holding the machete out in front of her. The hooded man spoke to her. Ida will be pleased to have the ritual fulfilled. You'll be the final piece. The mob started to yip and howl. The hooded man put an open-palmed hand in the air and silenced them. Sophia looked back at her mother. She could see two of the men pulling her from the ground and binding her hands behind her. She looked back at the hooded man. The thought of driving the machete into his face flashed in her mind, but she was outnumbered. They would be on her before her stroke fell. Leave my mama alone and you can have me. The mob began to laugh like a pack of hyenas. Again, the hooded man silenced them, keeping his gaze upon Sophia. We will have you regardless. Your role is to fulfill the ritual. Sophia hurled the machete at the man but it didn't fly with the grace of her knife. The hooded man deflected it with his lantern stick. His eye narrowed and the exposed half of his mouth turned downward. He looked up and nodded to two of the men standing in the circle around them. Sophia saw them approaching in her periphery. She looked back at her mother, and the men who had pulled her from the ground were now tightening a burlap sack around her head. Sophia started to run to her, but was caught by one of the two approaching men. He quickly pinned her to the ground. His toothy grin and wild eyes looked cartoonish in the moonlight. The smell of alcohol on his breath was strong, and it almost made Sophia gag as she struggled. As the other man approached, he pulled a vial from his leather bandolier. He tipped it into the palm of his hand, making a small pile out of the powder inside. Then he kneeled and grabbed Sophia's chin with his other hand. Delicately, he blew the powder into her face. Her thrashing slowed, and her vision began to blur. She tried to look around to see her mother, but all she could see was the orange light from the lantern and the black forms of the men standing around her, coalescing into a nightmarish mirage. She laid her head back and saw the moon in the sky, sitting amongst a blanket of stars. It started to ripple, and all of the stars became lines that quickly shifted back and forth. Then she saw nothing just black. A twang tickled Sophia's ear and welled up inside of her head. She felt warm and comfortable. Her eyes fluttered open and for a brief moment she didn't remember the events that had transpired. Then it all came flooding back to her like a dam breaking in her mind. She jumped up and tried to run, but fell. A plume of dry dirt puffed up all around her. Her ankle was shackled to a chain that was attached to a tree growing outside the perimeter of her cage. Lifting her head, she could see a grid of wood towering over her on all sides. The cage had no roof, but the opening at the top was surrounded by sharp pieces of metal. It was still night, but the moon hung lower on the horizon, giving her a gauge of how much time had passed since she had been put to sleep. She got to her knees and brushed the dirt from her eyes. The twang she had heard in her twilight sleep was clearer now. It sounded tinny, like a banjo, only deeper in register. As she listened more closely, she could hear a metal springing sound shifting up and down in pitch as well. Her cell was small, but big enough for the pile of hay she'd been sleeping on and a small trough of dirty water. Lanterns hung from the trees all around it, and there was a fire just on the other side. Sophia wasn't sure, but it looked like there were rows of structures off in the distance through the trees. Between her cell and those structures... More lanterns hung from the trees, like fireflies 
floating in the night. Then she noticed where the music was coming from. Two boys sat at the far edge of the fire. One was plucking an instrument that resembled a banjo but appeared to be made of more bones than wood. The other was flicking a jaw harp that was in his mouth and bobbing his knee up and down with the rhythm of the music. All around the fire they sat beside were animal heads on pikes that were jammed into the ground. Bones and feathers hung from the trees as well, along with strange talismans and charms that looked like they were forged from rusty pieces of metal and forgotten wood scraps. The boy, strumming the stringed instrument, began to sing. There were no words to his song, just a shifting tone that went up and down with the pitch of his instrument and the jaw harp. It was hypnotic and sounded wild and ancient. Sophia stared at them as they bounced more intensely to the rhythm. The song became faster, as did their playing and singing. They started jumping and kicking up dirt all around them. Their jumping became rhythmic as if they were doing some sort of dance. The bones that dangled from their necks and wrists began to clatter. Then, all at once, they stopped, and both of them let out a solid tone that matched in resonance. Their howl came to an end, and they turned to Sophia. She got to her feet and continued to stare as they slowly walked over to her. Their bare feet cracked a few twigs and rustled through leaves as they approached. They stopped a few feet from her cage, the older boy, who was playing the banjo-esque instrument, swung it to his back. They both stood in silence, staring at her. The fire behind them crackled and popped, and the younger boy lifted his hand in front of him and began making swift gestures with his fingers as he moved them through the air. Sophia had seen sign language before. Her mother was introducing it into their daily training, and she knew a bit of it. Communicating without making sound was a valuable asset in this harsh, post-apocalyptic world, but the hand motions of the boy didn't look like anything she had learned from her mother. They looked and felt more like he was casting some kind of spell or hex in her direction. Sophia felt uneasy, and she yelled out to him, Stop it! He continued, unaffected by her request. The other boy joined in, and their hand motions became synchronized. Sophia called out again. I said stop it. Seeming to be at the end of whatever ritual they were performing, they stopped. The older boy walked up to the grid of wood and put his face right into one of the square spaces. He had red paint smeared horizontally across his eyes. He smiled, and Sophia was disgusted by the sight of his black teeth. Where are we? Sophia asked calmly. The boy continued to smile and stare into her soul. You're right where you ought to be, at the edge of the world. We need your blood. Sophia, trying to remain calm, asked, Where's my mom? This time, the other boys stepped forward and spoke. We need her blood, too. She'll make us even more stronger. Then won't nobody be able to stop us. The older boy jabbed him in the ribs with his elbow. You done said enough, skunk. Now hush. He turned back to Sophia. I'm guessing they'll have you done in tomorrow night. Tonight's still one phase too soon. He glanced up at the moon. Sophia noticed something shifting in the tree line in the distance near the structures. It was a large black form, lumbering toward them and crouching beneath the trees. To its left, Sophia saw another form, much smaller and seeming to shuffle cautiously as it moved beside the giant. Several more that looked similar to the men she had encountered earlier emerged as well. The boys noticed her looking past them and turned to look themselves. They noticed the approaching figures, and the older boy nudged his head toward the fire, insisting that he and his companion take their seats again. Sophia watched the people in the distance get closer as the boys sat. As they approached the fire, Sophia could make out more of their details. The giant was another slave, shackled by the neck and leashed to one of the men. This giant was different from the one she had seen earlier, though. It was enormous, at least double the size of the one that had gone through her trailer. It had two extra arms protruding from its abdomen. One was large and muscular, bigger than the two above it. The other was small, about the size of one of Sophia's arms. His features looked as though they were melting on his face. His eyes and mouth drooped 
and swirled in a way that made them look like they were being sucked down a drain. Sophia, like her mother, felt sorry for the slaves. The hobbling figure next to the giant was clearer to her now as well. Light from the fire and the lanterns flickered off of her old, haggard face. She had a scar on her left cheek that resembled some of the runes and talismans that hung from the trees. Her walking stick was topped with a skull that looked to be some human-bird hybrid, and there were pink glowing crystals mounted in its eye sockets. They made their way to the edge of her cage. Sophia stared at the old woman. She was close enough now for Sophia to see her bright green eyes. Her cloak was a tapestry of fur and woven multicolored cloth. Golden symbols, similar to the one on the cloak of the man who had lit the lantern earlier that night, swirled and reflected on her cloak as well. Her hair was a tangled mess that had bones and charms strung throughout it. Sophia's mother had told her stories in the past, fairy tales that had witches and hags that tormented princesses in one way or another. She thought this woman resembled some of those characters. Her throat sounded like a churning bucket of gravel when she cleared it. Then she spoke. To the edge of the world you find yourself, young one. The ritual will be fulfilled. Sophia was becoming annoyed with everyone talking in riddles. What'd you do with my mom? The slack in the chain around her leg began to tighten. A man from the woman's entourage was pulling the chain on the other side of her cage. She moved with it, not wanting to topple to the ground. When she got to the edge of her cage, the man dropped the chain and presented a pair of wrist shackles. Sophia stared at the shackles and then looked up at the man. Hands, now, he commanded. Sophia considered her options. She could either refuse, which would probably have them binding her wrists anyway and dragging her across the forest floor toward whatever fate awaited her, or she could let them shackle her and spare herself the cuts and bruises. She presented her wrists, and the man slapped on the rusty metal shackles. Then he undid the chain attached to her leg from the tree. The giant that was standing next to the woman reached up to the top of the cage and removed a few chunks of the hazardous metal. Then he climbed up the wooden grid. The wood bowed and creaked with his weight. When he got to the top, he reached down and grabbed the chain that was still attached to her leg. He pulled it upward, and Sophia let out a surprised cry as she was pulled upside down into the air. The giant pulled her over the top of the cage and climbed back down with her. To Sophia's relief, he sat her on the ground much more softly than she expected. He held the chain as she got to her feet. Sophia was curious about their intentions. She wondered why they hadn't just outright killed her and her mother. There was much talk of a ritual and fulfilling it, as well as blood. She was curious about all those things, but at that moment, all she wanted to know was what they'd done with her mother. The woman and her crew turned and started to walk back to the structures they had come from. The giant, holding her chain, pulled it, and she lurched forward. Before Sophia could continue questioning them about her mother, the woman started to speak again. Child, there are forces beyond this world that guide us. They provide for us and bring us strength. There are punishments that they deal out when their needs ain't met, too. You are a savior to us. You'll help to keep their wrath from us and keep the flames of their blessings lit. Sophia, having had her hands shackled and her leg pulled by the giant holding the chain, was focused on not losing her balance as she moved across the forest floor. There was a narrow dirt path, but it was uneven and barely wide enough for one person, let alone several. Along the way, there were many wooden and stone sculptures. They took the shape of twisted human-animal hybrids. Moss grew on them, some more than others. Some of them had heads of humans and bodies of animals, such as goats or pigs. Others had animal heads on the bodies of humans. They were all unsettling to Sophia. As they walked, the one that stood out to her the most was a nude woman whose head was a goat skull. She was holding a large scythe in one hand and stalks of grain in the other. All of the sculptures had symbols carved or painted on them, just like the clothes and armor of her captors. They reached the line of structures, 
Sophia could now see a large wall that she hadn't noticed before in front of them. It towered over them. She heard voices and commotion on the other side of it, and there was a light flickering all along its top edge. Then she realized that the structures were attached to the wall. They must lead to the other side of the fence, she thought. The buildings and wall both looked like they were one with the earth itself. Moss and fungus grew on them. Both the structures and the wall were made out of a mixture of jagged stones and thick old pieces of wood. The woman, whom Sophia assumed was Ida and her followers, stopped in front of the door to one of the structures. Sophia looked up at the giant. Even in the pale light of the flickering lanterns around them, she could see pain and sadness on his face. They're prisoners too, she thought. She turned to the woman and said, You're no better than the devil himself keeping people as slaves like this. You should be ashamed of your... Her sentiment was cut short by the woman smacking her across the face with the back of her hand. She was old and frail, but the force of the woman's smack startled Sophia. Their place is here to serve us, just as yours is, child. Now be silent. Sophia looked up at the giant again. He looked both interested and confused. He was trained to obey ever since he was a young child. He'd never come into contact with anyone who viewed him as more than just a slave, except for a few in his distant memories before he was captured. He began to reach down to her, but two of the men pulled thin chains from their hips and began beating the giant with them. He let out a grunt and chattered his teeth together. One of the other men bent down and released the shackle from Sophia's ankle. Running wouldn't be wise, child, the old woman said. Then she grabbed Sophia's arm and yanked her up onto the steps that led into the building. The hinges of the door creaked eerily as she turned the knob and pulled it open. The rest of the men stayed behind, and the woman pulled Sophia through the door. For a moment, Sophia thought of ways that she might be able to take the old woman out. Her hands were tied behind her back, but that didn't mean she wouldn't be able to headbutt her. Sophia's mom had taught her a headbutt technique meant to drive someone's nose cartilage into their brain. She took one last look back across the expanse of woods to her holding cell, the fire, and the giant, before the door slammed closed behind them. The room they were in was very dark. Sophia could see lanterns hung high up on the walls, close to the ceiling. She strained her eyes to see more of the room as she was pulled along. Although it was late summer, the room smelled like wet, decaying leaves in the fall. It was an oddly comforting scent for Sophia. It reminded her of jumping into piles of leaves with her mother. The building was much shorter than it seemed from the outside, and was more of a walkway through the wall. Before Sophia's eyes could adjust to this new, dark environment, the door swung open on the opposite end of the structure. Light poured in, and the stark contrast blinded Sophia for a moment. After the white faded from her vision, Sophia saw what was on the other side of the wall. It was a village with encircling houses all around the edge of the wall's interior that looked like they were held together by a variety of different things. Some of them looked ancient and were built similarly to the structure Sophia and the woman had just gone through. Others looked newer and were pieced together from scavenged wood, metal, and bones. More bones, lanterns, talismans, clothes, and a variety of other things hung from ropes that were strung between the tops of the houses. Some of the homes were small, ramshackle huts. Most of the larger, older ones had short fences made of sharpened wood between stone posts. There was a massive fire in the middle of the encircling homes. Mixing with the light from the fire was the light of huge candles sprinkled all around the winding paths that led to the houses. They smelled like animal fat and burning rope. Their dripping wax created bulging pools at their bases. There were also smaller candles that were held by taxidermied animals along the paths as well. Sophia wondered how she and her mother had never come into contact with any of its inhabitants. If it were close enough to their trailer park, surely they would have heard something at some point. Yelling, building, or anything. Then she looked up at the moon and realized it was one phase past the phase it had been on the night of her capture. A whole day had passed since she had been poisoned to sleep, and there was no telling 
how far the marauders had taken her in that time. The hag pulled her down an uneven set of stone stairs onto a path that led to the bonfire. To Sophia's surprise, most of the village appeared to be awake and gathered near a stage that had been built near the fire. As they walked along the path and got closer to the fire, Sophia could start to make out more of the details of the gathered people. They were dancing. It was a slow, swaying, synchronized dance that reminded her of the one the two boys had done on the other side of her cage, hand gestures included. Some of the villagers were plucking instruments that sounded and looked like larger versions of the one the older boy had been playing as well. The stage they were lined up in front of had a backdrop that was blocking Sophia's view of whatever was happening on it. Chained to six posts on the outer edge of the gathered people were mutant giants, some of them even larger than the one that had pulled her from her cage. They were banging huge animal skin drums that reverberated downward into the earth. Sophia could feel their vibrations. They felt like a rhythmic earthquake as they approached. Sophia also noticed several men in armor and garb similar to the outfits of the men that had captured her, standing along the paths that wound in front of the homes. Guards are some sort of enforcers, she thought. As they walked past the stage's backdrop and moved to the front of it, Sophia could see what she wasn't able to before on the stage. She screamed, Mama! Her mother was center stage, tied to a pole. She was wearing a bouquet of orange and green flowers mixed with bones on top of her head. The gown they had put her in was once white, but had been stained and torn. Draped around her body was a wide piece of fabric that bore symbols Sophia was becoming familiar with, sewn into it, using gold thread. Her hands were bound above her head, and she was swaying to the rhythm of the instruments and chanting crowd. Sophia screamed again, No! Two of the village guards took her from the woman and restrained her as she tried to run to the stage. She was crying now, and although she felt helpless, she fought against the force of the guards. The music came to an end, and the crowd stopped dancing. The giants rested their hands on top of their drums. A figure approached Sophia's mother from the side of the stage. He was wearing a mask made of sticks and grains that were tied together. The face of the mask had two eye holes, and the gnarled sticks and grain stalks shot up over his head. He wasn't wearing a shirt, but his body was painted in red archaic symbols. A small human skull hung from the rope around his neck. As he approached Sophia's mom, he pulled a curved hand scythe into the air. Sophia started to scream again, and the crowd began to make a low, steady, droning chant. There was another figure behind Sophia's mother, she was seated atop a throne made of antlers, bones, and stones. Her outfit contrasted all of the other villagers with its decadence. Shimmering gems were sewn into her gown of cascading feathers. The crown of bones that sat on top of her head was coated in gold and lined with crystals. Although she looked regal compared to the rest of the village, she also looked like she was falling apart at the seams like she was an ancient thing that had recently been unearthed. Her face was gaunt and pale, and it looked as though it had never seen the light of day. She was scowling and staring at Sophia's mother. The drummers began to hit their drums again in a slow, low rhythm. Their rhythm got faster, and the chant became louder as the man with the scythe approached Sophia's mother. Sophia watched and thrashed, trying to break free to help her mother. The chanting and the drums grew even louder, and the man with the scythe extended it to Sophia's mother's throat. Sophia began to scream even louder, and one of the guards stuffed a filthy rag into her mouth. She tried to bite down on his fingers, unsuccessfully. The woman on the throne nonchalantly raised her hand, and the crowd became silent. Sophia stopped thrashing and came to the realization that the woman who had pulled her to the other side of the wall wasn't Ida. This was Ida. She spoke with a voice that demanded authority. Tonight, we spill the blood of the mother. The crowd cheered, yelling and howling. With her hand, she silenced them again. 
The blood of the mother shall mix with that of the child, and together our harvest will be bountiful and our strength will grow. The crowd cheered again and again she silenced them. Ida stood and looked out at her people with sunken black eyes. This is the edge of the world. As the everlasting circle in the sky becomes full tomorrow, we will please those that dwell in the stars. The mother's blood will mix with the daughter's, and we will be reborn. Ida made a fist in the air and let the cheers of the crowd go silent on their own. She flashed a series of hand gestures to the crowd, and they returned them to her. The giants hit their drums with one final slam. The man, with the mask of sticks and grain, ran his scythe along Sophia's mother's throat. Blood spilled out onto her neck and gown. The man bent quickly to pick up a basin that sat beneath her to collect the pouring blood. Sophia's screams and cries were muffled by the fabric in her mouth. She fought against the guards for a moment, and then collapsed. The guards held her up by her arms, and she dangled between them. The crowd let out a howl that swirled around her. It trapped her in the terror and grief of what she had just witnessed. Her mother's murder. Nothing could have prepared her for that. She'd been traumatized by seeing people killed before, but she had never lost anyone this close to her. Neighbors and friends in the past, but she never imagined that she would watch her mother killed in front of her. Her surroundings became a kaleidoscope of bones, howling faces, lanterns, candles, and blood. The sound of the villagers' screams and the pounding of the drums became a cacophony of static in her head. Sophia didn't remember being taken to another cage. After her mother was killed, she was in shock. She shuddered out of her stupor a few hours later. As her surroundings began to take shape, she realized she was in a large structure that resembled a barn. There were towering old wood planks all around her. Also, much like a barn, there were pins in rows lined along the walls. Inside the pins were several of the mutant giants, some of whom she recognized as the drum players from the ritual. Each of them was chained up by the neck, but had enough slack to move around their small pins. Sophia realized she was chained up by the ankle again. Her throat was raw from screaming. She also realized that someone had put her in the yellow dress that had given away her and her mother's location. Sophia didn't feel shocked anymore. She didn't feel hopeless, either. She felt angry. Through a small window, she saw the sun starting to come up. The sky was a smudged blanket of oranges and pinks. There was a guard standing at one of the exits of the barn, leaning against the wall. He had a long pole with a sharp piece of metal welded to the end of it. A makeshift spear no doubt meant to keep the giants in line. If Sophia's guess was right, the settlement of people was nocturnal. Before long, the guard would hopefully be completely asleep. Some of the giants were nodding off as well. Their sleep schedule was tethered to that of their captors. Sophia was wide awake. The rest she got from her shocked paralysis wasn't real rest, but it would be enough for now. Something startled her. It was a loud, deep breath that came from another cage sitting beside hers. She hadn't realized there was another cage behind the boards beside her. Sophia peeked through a hole that was punched from a wood knot into the cage. She saw the giant that had hoisted her out of her first cell. He was sitting on a stack of hay, twiddling his chain between his fingers. Sophia heard her mother's voice in her head. Advice, she once told her. Someday I won't be here, sweetheart. Someday you'll have to figure things out on your own. It's a hard world, and a lot of people aim to take whatever they can from you. Just remember that you'll find opportunities in places you never imagined. Sometimes, you might find friends there, too. Sophia wondered how many family members the slave had had to watch die in front of him. She wondered if he was born into a life of slavery, or if he had once been free. Had he fled from a burning settlement? Was his home burned to the ground? She thought. She glanced back at the guard by the exit. He was snoring. Sophia whispered to the giant. Psst! Hey! Hey! The giant's head perked up, 
but he couldn't tell where her voice was coming from. Sophia continued, Over here, at the hole in the wall. The giant scanned the wall in front of him and noticed the hole. He crawled over and put his massive green eye up to it. It glistened in the torchlight of the barn. Now that Sophia had his attention, she continued, Aren't you fed up? Aren't you tired of doing everything they tell you to do? Everything they force you to do? The giant stared at her blankly. Then he backed up from the hole a bit, and she was able to make out more of his face. He tugged at the chain around his neck, shrugged, and let out a discouraged sigh. You deserve better than this. You all deserve better than this. She captured the attention of some of the other slaves, and they leaned in to hear her. Sophia continued louder this time, but quiet enough to not rouse the sleeping guard. I can only imagine the lives you've had to live. The cruelty. The lack of basic needs. These people, this cult, has been keeping your minds and bodies as slaves for too long. You can't forget what it means to be free. Some of you may have been born into this, and some of you may have been out there in the world, in the, in the free world, at one time. You've been forced into this nightmare, and maybe the nightmare just feels normal now, I don't know. It's not. I used to be safe and happy out there, but I had to run. My mom and I had to run. But I'm done running. I'm tired of running. Sophia started to cry again. Thoughts of her mother being killed flooded back into her mind, but she needed to focus. She could surrender to despair or push forward. We've got a choice. It's a hard world out there. I've lived in it, just like some of you. You can stay here and let fear win. You can let it shackle you to a life that's barely worth living. Or you can fight and get out of here. It can be a dark and cruel place out there, but I promise it's better than this. I'll help you in it. I'll help you understand and, and build a life worth living. But I need your help. With all of you working together, we can get out of here. She looked around at the caged mutants. They were all staring at her, listening. When the time comes, we need to strike. I know there's a fire inside all of you that's burning to be free. The giants looked around at each other and then back at Sophia. She put her fist into the air and looked around to meet all of their eyes. Then she looked back to the hole to meet the eye of the giant in the cell beside her. A bit louder, she asked, Are you with me? For a moment, the giants just stared at her. Sophia was worried that her words had fallen on the ears of slaves who were too brainwashed to accept anything other than the lives they were forced to live. Then, from across the barn, one of the slaves slowly raised his fist into the air. The slave in the cell next to his followed his lead. And soon, they all did. The day went on, and between the dozing of the watch guard, Sophia was able to come up with a plan and relay it to the giants. Everybody understand? Sophia asked after going through the plan one final time. The slaves nodded, and Sophia took a deep breath. Get some sleep, if you can. Sophia walked to her trough of water and took a drink with her hand. Then she laid down on the mound of hay stacked up in the corner of her cell. There was no way she was going to be able to go to sleep with everything on her mind. It felt good to know she wasn't running. It felt good to know that the people who killed her mother would soon get what they deserved. Among the many things her mother taught her was the ability to find a sense of calm in times of great distress. They would meditate often and clear their minds. It was something Sophia enjoyed doing with her mom, and now... She understood why she had made doing it such a priority. The ability to clear your mind in a world that could be chaotic and unforgiving was a valuable skill. Eventually, even with the impending ritual and fight for her freedom looming on the horizon of her mind, Sophia slept. She was exhausted and felt like she was melting into the hay beneath her. After what felt like a few moments, she snapped awake. It looked much darker in the barn, and Sophia could tell that it was night. There was a commotion coming from the other side of the barn door, and it swung open on huge rusted hinges. A loud screech cut through the air. Sophia heard the faint, familiar sound of one of the banjo bone instruments outside. She also heard rattling. 
She looked around to see the sleeping slaves in the other cells stir awake. A large cart rolled into the barn. It had big, rickety wooden wheels, and several lanterns hung from the wooden cage strapped to the top of it. It was decorated in a macabre way. Taxidermied animals lined the sides of it, seeming to cling to it. Raccoons, possums, and squirrels. Massive ones that must have come from irradiated bloodlines, like the slaves. Sophia had seen her share of large mutant animals in the wild, but none that looked as mutated and twisted as these. The cart stopped, and one of the guards jumped off of the mounted bench and walked to Sophia's cell. He produced a large key ring and sifted through a few keys. He looked similar to some of the guards she had seen the previous night, but seemed to be dressed in a more ceremonious fashion. Sophia looked up at the other guards and realized that they all were. With the plan in place, Sophia didn't struggle against the guard as he bound her hands and walked her to the cart. He put her in the cage and got back on the cart's bench. She looked out of the cage at the slaves and nodded. Several of them nodded back. Then she raised her fist in front of her, not all the way into the air, but high enough for them to see. They returned the gesture. One of the guards on the bench shouted and whipped one of the slaves that had been pushing the cart. Dust flew into the air as the cart rushed off, the two slaves pulling it away. Sophia was surprised to see that they were careening down a narrow path that had towering wooden fences on the left and right of it. The guard with the whip snapped it across the back of the other giant, and they sped up. Lanterns were mounted on the fences, and with their glow, Sophia could see thousands of symbols painted on the wood. The cart lurched sideways as they went around a bend and came into an opening. Sophia recognized where she was. They came into the village space she had been taken to before to watch her mother die. Only they were on the other side of it. The cart whizzed down one of the narrow lanes, kicking up rocks and dirt behind it. Then one of the guards yelled for the giants to stop. Sophia flew forward with the abrupt force of the cart, stopping and almost slammed into the front of the cage. They stopped in front of a peculiar-looking house. It was one of the older-looking ones that appeared bigger than most of the others. The moss that grew on its stones seemed to swirl and cascade down it. The candles on its porch were like the oversized ones she had seen the night before, only they had a more pleasant fragrance. Wind chimes lined the porch as well, along with talismans and effigies made from hair, twine, bones, and feathers. There was a cage on the porch, next to a twisted rocking chair that held a creature Sophia couldn't identify. It seemed to be some kind of bird, but it had teeth and scales. It was no doubt another creature from a lineage of irradiated mutations. After seeing so many people and animals affected by radiation and fallout, Sophia felt grateful that she and her mother hadn't been caught in its wake. She thought of how her life could have very easily been similar to the slaves in this settlement had her genetics been affected by it. One of the guards pulled her from the cage and walked her up the stone steps to the door. He pounded on the door, and after a moment, someone answered. It was a girl, about Sophia's age. The top half of her face was painted red and the bottom half was painted white. Around her neck, there was a piece of jewelry encased in a striking, archaic symbol made from bones. She had feathers strung through her long, braided hair, and the white fabric that draped all around her rippled across the floor as she walked. She looked up at the guard and took Sophia from him. Jerking her through the doorway, she slammed the door quickly behind them. Inside... Sophia saw a few more girls that looked similar to the one that opened the door. They had different colors and styles of paint on their faces and different arrangements of feathers in their hair. They all looked busy. On the far end of the room, there was an ancient fireplace that lit the entire space. There was one circular stained glass window high on the ceiling above it. The moonlight passed through it. There were stone pillars all around them and a long burgundy carpet that stretched the length of the room as well. On the other side of the room, near the fireplace, there were two wide steps that went to an elevated floor. That level of the room had bookcases and tapestries lining the walls. There were also tables that had vials, mortars and pestles, candles, crystals, stones, and a variety of tools and instruments Sophia 
had never seen before sitting on them. In the center of that elevated space, in front of the fireplace, was a chair. This is what the girls were hard at work on. They were decorating it. The woodwork on the chair itself was more ornate and intricate than any object Sophia had ever seen. There were small, detailed sculptures carved and painted into the tall, wide backrest depicting different scenes. Some were of farmers harvesting grains and hauling bags of produce. Others were of birds hatching from eggs and mothers holding their babies. Some of the scenes disturbed Sophia. Decaying animals with worms growing from them. A swarm of butterflies flying out of a human ribcage. Running along the top arch of the backrest were the phases of the moon. The full moon was in the middle, with the other phases to the left and right of it. Each moon had a symbol carved into it. The girls were weaving plants all around the chair. Some of them were green and leafy, and some were floral. They were all woven around the chair in a way that went up the legs and around the armrests, and framed in the scenes on the tall, wide backrest. It was a psychedelic piece of art floating in the middle of a bouquet of plants. Sophia stood there, soaking it all in. She didn't need to be told what it was. She already knew. It was the chair they were going to kill her in. She felt a hand grip her shoulder from behind. It was someone taller than the girl who had met her at the door, and Sophia felt she didn't need to turn around to see who it was. She spoke, and Sophia cringed at the sound of her familiar voice. Ain't it beautiful, child? It was the woman from the night before who had fetched her from her first cage. You are so lucky. Your life actually means something, while so many who live lead lives that are meaningless. Sophia spun around and looked at the woman. She was just as withered by the sands of time as Sophia remembered. A broken old hag. She was dressed similar to how she had been the night before, but instead of wearing a dark cloak shrouded in furs, she wore a light cloak. The furs that surrounded this one were albino, bushy, and white. The moon's full, she continued. With your blood, our harvest will be bountiful and our strength will grow. Sophia, annoyed, replied, So I've heard. The old woman waved at some of the girls who were decorating the chairs to come to her. Two of them took Sophia by the elbows and led her to the chair. To her surprise, the old woman untied the rope from her wrists. There are guards all around this village and slaves that would snap you in half faster than you could imagine. If you don't believe me, try to run. It's better to have you die when the moon is at its peak. But it certainly doesn't have to be, child. Sophia wanted to grab the old woman by her hair and slam her face into her knee. She wanted to throw her into the fireplace and watch her burn. But she also couldn't risk messing up the plan. Now that she had gotten the slaves involved... She felt she owed them her promise. It wasn't about her anymore. It was about all of them. Sophia sat in the chair, and the two girls quickly tied her arms to it with several ropes. Two more girls did the same to her legs. Then the girls began to paint her face in a similar fashion to theirs. The bottom half was white, and it faded up into the top half, a seafoam green. Then they went about weaving plants and flowers around the ropes that bound her to the chair. Their last bit of preparation was fitting Sophia with a headdress of feathers and flowers that looked like the ones woven into the chair. Bones dangled from short, thin chains attached to her headpiece. The girls stepped back from the chair and smiled. All of the girls in the room surrounded her. They bent and picked up the chair. The old woman hobbled down the stairs to a set of double doors on the side of the room and flung them open. Sophia heard voices outside of the door, chanting in unison. Slowly, the girls descended the short set of stairs with her and walked to the opened doors. As they approached the threshold, Sophia looked out into the crowd that was even bigger than the night before. Rows of villagers wearing white ceremonial garb were swaying and chanting. Their hands fluttered with synchronized gestures, and their chanting was low and ominous. 
They were all looking up at her as the girls carried the chair above them. The ground dipped and waved under the long pieces of white fabric that trailed them. The girls were graceful, and Sophia could tell that they had practiced this procession many times. Sophia could tell that the villagers were even more excited than they had been the night before. Their ceremonial outfits adorned with symbols, bones, feathers, and furs flowed and dipped in unison like a sinister wave cresting in the ocean and crashing into the shoreline, a beach of Sophia's impending death. They approached the stage. Sophia saw Ida sitting on her throne again, glaring down at her with her soulless eyes. This time, though, she was smiling. The makeup around her eyes was dark. It stretched upward and downward on her face in tendrils that looked like roots reaching into the earth. Her gown on this night was an array of white feathers and furs, and her crown of bones was replaced with a crown of four white antlers, each with a blooming blue flower at the end. The base had many green gems set in it. She also wore an old, tattered sash that had faded with time. It was covered with small, swirling runes and symbols. She locked eyes with Sophia and stared at her. The smile on her her face looked genuine to Sophia. This was no act of pageantry or pompous display of superiority. She was genuinely happy. Sophia felt she should have been scared or worried, but she wasn't. Again, she felt anger rise to the top of her head and flush her cheeks. She smiled back at Ida as she heard another piece of her mother's advice from her past in her head. Sweetie, sometimes in life, there are villains. I know I've told you stories about people who've lost their way or people that have had bad things happen to them and they get sucked into the darkness and they find the light again, but sometimes in life people get too far gone. They don't find the light. Sometimes, people get lost in the darkness. Sophia knew that she was part of some sort of ritual. This village was using her to please some god or gods they worshipped for a good harvest, good fortune, or strength. She also knew, based on Ida's smile, that Ida would enjoy watching her die. Ida considered this moment entertainment just as much as she considered it a sacrifice for her people. Perhaps at some point, Ida genuinely believed the ceremony would be in the best interest of her people and that it was necessary to facilitate their well-being. But now, it was more than that to her. She was lost in the darkness. The full moon was rising high in the sky above them, and soon it would be at its peak. Like the night before, There were six mutant slaves chained to posts around the crowd of villagers, banging huge animal skin drums. They were some of the mutants from the barn, and they stared at her too as she was carried up the middle of the crowd. One of the mutants' eyes darted back and forth from her to his drum in a panicked way. Sophia gave him a look, as if to say, Calm down, everything's going to be fine. It seemed to comfort him a bit. On the outskirts of the crowd, Sophia saw guards. She thought she recognized some of them from the night she and her mother were captured. There were also more mutant slaves among them. Sophia recognized one or two from the barn, but the rest she didn't. She hoped that word of her plan had made it to them from her companions, or at least, if they saw what was about to unfold, they'd join in and fight with them. The girls carrying her stopped, and Sophia turned to look back at the stage. There were grain-masked men, on the stages left and right. Both of them had round hand scythes strapped to their waists. There were vague glimmers in the eye holes of the masks. Their eyes looked like dark pits, like Ida's. The girls set the chair down. The crowd was swaying and dancing more intensely now. The drums were banging louder, and the twangy sound of the bone banjo instruments pinged through the air. All of the sound reverberated off of the archway of the stage. It bounced off the ceiling and back of it, back to the crowd. Now that Sophia could see the stage better, she noticed how ornately it was carved and painted. The images on it were similar to the ones on her chair. A giant she had noticed on their approach came from the side of the stage and lifted her onto it. The two grain-masked men 
walked over and pulled her back further on the stage, closer to Ida. The drums were getting louder, and the crowd's chant was growing more intense. Sophia looked out at them. She thought they looked like maggots, wiggling out of a decomposing animal, a comparison she might not have made under different circumstances. She was angry. She wanted to watch birds fly down and peck them away like worms from the earth after a spring rain. She wanted to take a scythe from one of the men's waists and run it across Ida's throat, but she had to be patient. She had to wait for things to be set in motion. Ida raised a cruel hand to the crowd, silencing them. In the silence, Sophia could hear her own breathing and her heart pounding in her chest. She looked out at the giants holding the drums and the ones that were off standing with the guards. They were still, but Sophia hoped the guards didn't see their shifting, nervous glances. Ida began to speak. We are at the edge of the world. The crowd cheered, and she silenced them with her hand. Tonight we ward off the eternal blight that plagues the underworld. With the blood of the daughter and the blood of the mother, we will become stronger than ever. The crowd cheered again, and as they did, one of the grain-faced men put a porcelain bowl filled with blood at Sophia's feet. It was her mother's blood. Sophia's eyes widened at this. She screamed internally as tears rolled down her cheeks. Ida continued, As we welcome the sphere in the heavens to bring fortune, we gather to us the energy of our ancestors and the strength of generations to come. She began swirling her hands in the air, twisting them together in a ritualistic way. The hands of the people in the crowd mirrored hers. She raised them up to the moon, overhead, and again the crowd followed her lead. They all began to howl. It was a menacing, dark tone that echoed off the stage and filled Sophia's head. She looked to her right and saw one of the grain-faced men pull the scythe from his hip. That was the sign. Sophia looked out to the giants and began nodding to them. The man moved closer to her with the scythe, but the giants didn't move. She looked back at the giants and nodded with more urgency. Then she started to scream. She felt like a caged animal being put down, trapped, and hopeless. Rage welled up inside of her again, and she started thrashing and pulling against the ropes that had her strapped to the chair. She turned back to the approaching man, ready to spit at him, bite him, or do anything she could to fight back, when all of a sudden, one of the massive animal skin drums slammed into him. His body flew across the stage, and the scythe he had taken from his waist impaled him in the chest. Blood smeared across the floor of the stage, and Ida lowered her hands and looked. She looked at Sophia, and then out to the crowd. All that could be heard was the crackle of the bonfire. Then, like a villain from one of Sophia's mother's stories, she pointed a crooked finger out at the giant that had thrown the drum, and yelled, Bring him down! Before any of the guards could react, the giant, closest to the stage, pulled the pole that his neck shackle was attached to out of the ground. He used the chain that shackled him to swing the unearthed pole into the air. He whirled it around and took out several people in the crowd. The giant, who had thrown his drum at the grain-masked man, was hit with a poisoned arrow from one of the guards. The other giants threw their drums at the guards on the perimeter. Some of the guards were taken out by them, while others rolled out of the way. The crowd started to run in all different directions. Ida screamed, Cut her throat! The ritual must be completed! The masked man on Sophia's left pulled his scythe from his belt and moved closer to her. She was thrashing even harder now. He was upon her, about to cut her throat with the scythe, when one of the giant's poles smashed into him. Sophia heard his bones crack and saw his form turn into a mangled puddle. The boards beneath him cracked with the force of the falling pole. That force sent the porcelain bowl into the air, coating Sophia in her mother's blood. Her chair lost its balance from the stage splintering beneath it and toppled forward off of the stage. The chair itself cracked and splintered when it hit the ground. 
It was a long fall, but the long, wide backrest absorbed most of the impact that would have otherwise been taken by Sophia's head. She felt the ropes that bound her to the chair slacken. With the chair crippled beneath her, she slid free from the ropes. A guard from the side of the stage ran at her. He was thrusting a weapon that looked like a pitchfork or a trident in front of him. A giant leapt from behind her and smacked the man, sending him flying like an annoying mosquito. Sophia looked around at the chaos. Villagers were running. Giants were fighting guards all around her. Some of the giants had used the bonfire to set houses and other structures ablaze. She wiped her mother's blood out of her eyes and looked up at the giant that had smacked the man away. Can you put me back on the stage? She shouted. The giant looked at her, confused as to why she wanted to go back on stage, where she was almost sacrificed. Please, she shouted. The giant nodded, picked her up, and started to put her back onto the stage. Another guard ran up and stabbed the back of the giant's leg with a long spear. He toppled forward, and Sophia flew through the air toward the stage. The momentum of the falling giant propelled her body across the stage and into Ida who was screaming commands at the guards in their fight against the giants. They collided, and Sophia felt Ida's frail form beneath her gown of soft furs and feathers pop and crack. After their collision, Ida clawed at Sophia. She was much more fierce than Sophia had anticipated. Her dark, black eyes reflected the orange of the fires in the burning village. Sophia pulled one of the ropes that still dangled from her arm around Ida's wrist and slammed her to the floor of the stage. Ida popped back up, furious. How dare you, she screamed. Your life had meaning. Your death had a purpose, and now you've wasted it. You're nothing. Ida lunged at her and tackled her to the stage. They were grappling with each other, spinning and pinning one another back and forth. Sophia pulled Ida's crown from her head and tried to bash her with it. Ida caught her by the wrist and bit her arm. Blood ran down and Sophia dropped the crown as she screamed. Yes, Ida hissed. The blood will flow. Ida pinned the hand of the arm she had just bitten to the stage and snarled like a wild animal. Then she opened her mouth and lunged downward, aiming her teeth at Sophia's neck. Sophia grabbed Ida's hair and pulled as hard as she could, ripping out a fistful. Ida screamed and jumped up backing off a bit, feeling the raw, bloody part of her head. Sophia saw the porcelain bowl that had collected her mother's blood lying near them. She picked it up and ran toward Ida. Ida was snarling again and had both of her hands up like a rabid cat, ready to pounce. When Sophia smashed the bowl into her head, Sophia dropped it as it broke into hundreds of shattered pieces. She felt her heartbeat and heard a ringing in her ears as she looked out to the burning village. The guards were losing the battle against the slaves. Ida made a groaning sound. Sophia looked at her lying on the stage. Her blood and her mother's blood were speckled across her white furs and feathers. One of the hand scythes that was meant for Sophia's throat was lying on the stage, not far from her feet. She picked it up and walked to Ida, Ida was in a daze from the impact of the bowl as Sophia dragged her to the edge of the stage. Sophia sat on top of her and smacked her a few times, rousing her from her daze enough to listen to what she had to say. I don't know if you in this village were always this way, or if the world did something to change you. I guess in the end, it changes all of us, whether we want it to or not. Maybe this is the edge of the world, the point of no return where you go over if you're not careful. Sophia heard an explosion in the distance and screams from the villagers. You took too much from me and I I don't know. Sophia was crying, clenching her teeth. I've seen over the edge of the world now and I don't think there's any going back for me. I was already so tired of running. Now I'm just tired and mad. She wiped the tears from her eyes, smearing her paint and blood-covered face. I don't think there's any saving you, Ida. Nothing left worth saving. If this world's going to have any hope for a future, we can't have people like you in it. Sophia slid the scythe across Ida's neck. Ida screamed and choked on her blood as it bubbled from her gaping neck hole. 
Rage welled up in Sophia again. She began stabbing Ida in the chest over and over with the sharp tip of the scythe. She screamed as Ida's blood coated her arms, hands, and face. Sophia's screams became a howl as she continued to mutilate Ida. She was screaming, howling, and stabbing out of control like a wild animal. With one final plunge of the scythe, she stopped. She was out of breath, and the village was burning all around her. She rolled off of Ida onto her back and stared up at the moon. It was beautiful to her. The cacophony of screams, fire, and yelling swirled all around her. Then a face eclipsed the light from the moon above her. It was the swirling face of the giant she'd met before. Sophia sat up, and the giant extended his hand. She took it, and the giant very delicately dropped her to the ground in front of the stage. It was clear that they had won. Many of the bodies of the guards were already being thrown into the bonfire, and the homes and structures of the village were burning ferociously. The villagers that hadn't been killed had fled, along with the more cowardly guards. The survivor part of Sophia's brain thought about all of the useful supplies being burned and wasted, but she didn't really care. She was happy to see all of their terrible symbols, effigies, and wicked ways of life reduced to ashes. It was over. Sophia made good on her promise. She helped the giants build a new settlement. No slaves, no rituals. It was home. There were luscious gardens and plenty of room for any travelers who found themselves without a settlement. They even worked to free many slaves from settlements they found in the wild. The sign on the wooden archway at the entrance of their new home read, A New World. And underneath that, Those who are free dwell here. Sophia thought about her mother often, and after years, she helped to build a statue in her honor in the center of her settlement. When the anniversary of her mother's death came each year, she would light a bonfire. Although she was at peace in her new life, a question lingered in her mind. She wondered if doing what she had done to the village and its people made her any better than them. She helped to burn their homes down and killed their leader. Although their rituals were savage and misguided, she wondered if what she'd done made her any different from them at all. As she stared into the anniversary flames of the bonfire, she remembered herself in a yellow dress, years ago, covered in blood, howling at the moon, at the edge of the world. I really hope y'all enjoyed this one. I had such a great time writing it. I feel like it had a lot of thematic elements that I haven't touched on before, and it was certainly the most, probably the most brutal one I've I've written, uh, the most brutal story I've written so far. Honestly, as I was writing it, it went in, in directions that I, I did not anticipate. They all do. Every single one of them does that. While I was writing this one particularly, I had these like weird, I wasn't like mad, but I had these just sort of like internal feelings of anxiety and I guess anticipation or frustration that were kind of guiding or fueling the plot of this one. And it's cool how art works in that way, where you can see an actual, like, tangible manifestation of the writer or musician or sculptor, or wh- whatever the medium is. You can see a physical manifestation of their emotions inside of the things that they make. When I started writing this one, I took some notes, and I really wanted to stick to a theme of just raw and gritty, and um, I wanted to have this sort of desolate post-apocalyptic feeling where the listener feels kind of trapped with Sophia in this world that she's been, um, that she's been captured inside of. And I also wanted it to be a story of revenge. That was one of the the notes that I took is like, this is a revenge story. And I know with a lot of 
writing and a, a lot of things that I've read about writing is you have to, uh, or you don't have to, but it's important to have a character go through some sort of transformation. And I feel like with this story, uh, Sophia going through such cruelty and having the the world that she's a part of throw so much cruelty at her, um, the transformation she goes through is is kind of dark. It it's really dark. It it hardens her and it turns her into a completely different person. But she also gains this um, perspective she didn't have before as being kind of like an innocent girl. It, it's kind of like the transformation of her going from like a child to an adult and seeing some of the harsh realities of the world. In her world specifically, those realities are a lot harsher than they would be in 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 a lot of people's worlds in our reality but um that was sort of the transformation that i wanted to materialize in this story and of course the revenge and i wanted it to be brutal and raw and 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 kind of gory and and gnarly so i i <laughs> i hope that you enjoyed it and if this is the first episode you're listening to this one's a, l- a little more um, darker and sinister and I want to say like violent and gory than most of the stories that I write. This has definitely been the most violent one. Um, I'm not going to say I won't tread into those waters in the future because I absolutely I absolutely do intend to. But for the most part, I don't typically get this violent, but I wanted to do one that hit that um, realm, it hit that pocket. If you'd like to support the podcast, there are a plethora of ways you can do so. The first of which is just telling your friends and family uh, about this podcast and about the stories and letting them know that you're enjoying them and um, letting them know that this uh, podcast exists. The second way is to leave a rating or review on whatever podcast streaming service you're listening on. If you're on Spotify, Apple Music, if you're listening on YouTube, all of the platforms have a way to leave a thumbs up or a star or, or some kind of a... Or I don't want to say all the platforms. Most of the platforms have a way to leave a rating or review. If you can do that, that goes an incredibly long way as well. I also have a Patreon where I share exclusive content, some um, like behind the, behind the scenes, behind the story content, and some exclusive stories and things like that. You also get um, early access to each episode, and I am uh, gearing up to add even more content to that Patreon. So if you are a current patron, thank you so much for the support. And if you're thinking about clicking that link, there is a link to my Patreon in the show notes of this episode and in all of the episodes. However you support, I cannot thank you enough. And thank you, just thank you so much for listening to this story and any and all of the stories that that you listen to. I hope that they are enhancing your day and I hope that they are, that I hope that they've been entertaining for you. The next episode will be out really soon. I'll see you all next time. And until then, Keep creating.